All right, thank you very much for having me here. Um, so I'm going to be pre presenting a paper. It's joint with uh, Treb Allen and Cameron Belier. And um, it's uh, very, very preliminary. Um, and so uh, the pro is that you get to see what I'm thinking in real time. And the con is I kind of have uh, a few different parts of the paper. And today I'm going to show you uh, preliminary uh, results and analysis on each part. Um, but they haven't quite been uh, integrated together perfectly. And so let me just tell you, um, this is kind of a broad uh, title, let me tell you more specifically what we're doing today. And so um, the context I'm going to be thinking about the diffusion of knowledge um, and uh, across space and across agents is going to be in the context where there are going to be doctors who are learning about which medicines they want to prescribe. And it's going to be in a context in a world where new medicines are going to be invented over time and doctors are going to have to learn sort of what are the properties of these new medicines that are being invented. So this is a, not an, uh, uh, an innovation model. So we're going to take the invention of these new medicines as given, but then we're going to say once they're invented, sort of how do doctors start using them. And this is going to be um, uh, a paper that's trying to be uh, quantitative, and so it's going to have some empirical content. Um, and the data we're going to be using is data on every single doctor in the United States who, during the period of 2000 to 2010, uh, wrote a prescription for uh, a particular type of drug. And the class of drugs are called statins, which are drug-lowering, uh, uh, cholesterol-lowering uh, drugs. And so there's a very common uh, drug that's taken in the US. Um, during this time period, we got kind of lucky that this is a good time period to study this question because there are going to be new dr many new drugs invented. And in addition to having new molecules invented, like totally new, uh, new formulas, um, there are also going to be generics that are coming on the market, which are going to be exact replicas uh, uh, chemically of drugs that already existed, but they are no longer patented, and so they're no longer owned by any, any the uh, rights to produce them are not owned by any one company, and so they're, they're very cheap. Um, and I'll tell you for some identification issues where having generics uh, around might be, might be useful. Um, and so what I'm going to show you is that the initial patterns of adoption um, and the subsequent spread of, of the use of these different drugs have systematic spatial patterns. And so I'm going to show you that, and then let me tell you sort of what I'm going to do uh, and why I'm writing this paper. So, so what I'm going to do is the first part, I'm going to show you statistical properties of the prescription patterns across time and across space. So this is going to be the first paper I've written that's going to have just the linear or log linear regressions. And I'm going to try to show you some of the patterns of sort of who starts using this uh, and how that's a, a function of space and how that changes over time. Um, the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to develop a simple model of doctors choosing which drugs to prescribe. And I'm going to sort of say, given whatever beliefs have of doctors about the quality of different drugs, um, how do they choose which drug to prescribe to different patients? Um, and uh, uh, this is going to be sort of an altruistic model of doctors trying to give the patients the best drugs they can with some understanding that they know they don't know perfectly what drugs should go to which patients. Then. Um, once I sort of develop this simple model of, of doctor uh, scripting, um, I'm going to write down sort of where do these beliefs about the quality of drugs or who should give, who should get which drugs. And so what I'm going to do is develop a dynamic model of social learning on a simple network. And the network is going to be useful to describe, to, to allow me to try to speak about space, um, like geography. Yeah, so, so let me get to, to, to the end of this slide, and then I'll tell you about all the caveats and what I'm not going to be able to address that well, and uh, sort of get some of your feedback on, is this a fatal flaw, to, you know, a stab in the heart, or, or can I still go on? So um, let me just finish telling you what I'm going to do, and then, then we can talk about that. So um, the, the basic model is going to have some doctors living in a location. Each location is going to be either more or less connected to other locations. And then doctors are going to choose how much to invest in acquiring knowledge. Um, and the knowledge that they acquire will be a, for a given amount of investment will be a function of where they live, how much knowledge they currently have, perhaps, and uh, the knowledge of other doctors. Um, and so 
as I said, super preliminary. And so I'm going to show you some building blocks of each of these three things. And I, I hope in, in, when the paper is actually written, you know, each of these three things is, is fleshed out uh, much more. But what I wanted to have for you today is sort of the, the, the initial uh, results on each of these sections. And so what I'm going to do going forward is sort of start with some of these statistical patterns, um, talk a little bit about how we might interpret them in the light of the, the actual context um, of, you know, maybe it's, uh, it's not all learning um, that's just happening from talking to other doctors or, 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 or just practicing their, in their practice alone. There might be other ways that doctors are learning that this is, at least so far, the structural model will not have. But uh, we can talk about how that might help me uh, change my interpretation of the statistical relationships that I'm about to show you. So this is a little bit uh, your diffusion pattern is going to look like more or less like uh, uh, the acrylic as, uh, exercises that uh, the diffusion of more varieties, right? That you try yeah. some more what your colleagues recommend that go into a congress or a workshop where they plan. Absolutely. So I'm certainly very uh, indebted uh, intellectually to that, that line of research. And so um, I'll show you what the, the patterns look like. But uh, the, the idea I have in mind on why I even think it's worth trying to look for these types of patterns is, is stuff related to that. And then, and then on the firm expansion side, there's this work by Tom Holmes, which sort of sees, you know, he has this beautiful Walmart picture of it starts locally and then spreads out and spreads out and spreads out. And so, um, yeah, I think there's a lot of work about the sort of, there, or there are some work about spatial diffusion. Um, and, and I'm going to try to take it to this, this data, which I think is uh, particularly well suited um, to, to analyze this question. And I'm going to be trying to, let me tell you on the next slide, sort of a little bit of relation to this literature. And then I'll tell you sort of why I'm trying to write this paper. So given what's been done. Please. This might be a warning issue, but you had in the previous slide the function of location. Yeah. What do you mean by location? Is that the location of yeah. city? Good question. So, so, no, I'll, I'll give you, just so you can have the right context in your mind and the data, um, location is going to be a zip code in the United States. So it's going to be a geographic location. Um, and I might have lots of properties about that zip code, but it's just going to be, that's the, 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 the piece of data. And then in the model, location is going to be a point on a simple network. And uh, um, we'll get to that. But roughly speaking, I'm going to draw a little bit on the trade literature. And I'm going to say sort of two locations are just two points that are connected by some distance. And that distance is going to affect economically important things. So um, it's going to be a, a sort of a, a, a bilateral uh, link. Um, and, and for anything more detailed than that, I'm going to have to wait to the math. OK. So the way I see this, uh, again, because it's a, uh, uh, still a new paper, I'm a little bit less uh, knowledgeable about the related literature than I'd like to be. So I know a I dug a little bit deeper into this marketing literature, and I know the idea diffusion literature uh, relatively well. Um, the social learning literature is what I'm, I'm still pretty ignorant on and, and trying to learn more about. But let me just uh, connect it to, to at least the two that I'm pretty aware of. So there is actually a large literature, even about doctors uh, prescribing drugs uh, or, uh, and, and it broadening more beyond just doctors, um, there's a large literature on discrete choice and learning. And my proposal, you know, what I have in the back of my mind is doctors are learning about the quality of the drugs and then they're making discrete choices, sort of prescribe this drug to this patient. And so Erdem and Keen is a real seminal paper in the discrete choice and learning literature. Um, and, and there's many, many papers that have, that have uh, been built on this similar technology. And so to, to the best of my reading, um, what's absent in this literature is one, a focus on geography, so space. So some of the statistical patterns I'm going to show you about the uh, 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 systematic patterns of adoption across space is missing from all these models of discrete choice and learning. And they're missing something where this, the returns to getting signals are endogenous in the sense that, uh, you know, in my model, if uh, other doctors are really well informed and I get to talk to them and learn from them, then the quality of the, the signal I'm getting or the effective number of signals could be high. And so um, in the most of this literature, as far as I can tell, they just take the returns to a signal as given and sort of you, you receive signals um, uh, in, in a learning context. And so 
Um, that's roughly speaking how I think we're going to differentiate our, ourselves there. What they are better at that, that I'm not going to have in my simple model today is exactly this issue of, of marketing. And so in this learning context, a lot of these papers have focused their effort on um, sort of learning by sampling, by basically buying the product. This is usually like grocery stores and which brand of diaper should I buy, things like that. Um, and then also there's advertising on the, on the, on the, the TV. You see, you know, uh, buy Pampers, buy Pampers. And they try to distinguish sort of how much of, of uh, the adoption or the purchases of Pampers is because of uh, the, the advertising versus not. I, I don't have that today, but uh, give me a second to, to tell you why I still think you should, uh, should listen to me. I'm saying I'm going to be adding in my model the returns to signals are going to be endogenous. They're going to be equilibrium objects. And so um, in their models, there are, there's a, a fixed signal structure. And the return to getting to, to investing one hour and trying to learn is fixed. And in my model, that'll be changing. It'll be an equilibrium object. Right. That's right. I think that's a good way of describing it. Yes. That is true. Maybe you're not exploiting it, but, but that's there too, right? So. That's definitely true. Um, and and I, I think it's a correct point that I have nothing to say beyond <laughs> your correct point. <laughs> no, but I mean, it tells you, I think it literally tells you something, right? So how, how, how yeah. I believe the drug is working, whether I'm taking it or not. That's right. In the data, I don't have any information on on uh, the doctors uh, taking it or not. So I wouldn't be able to slice it that way. But I think you're right. If I knew that, that could be informative. Yes, please. I think that there must be a literature where doctors have been interviewed and surveyed as to why they started to prescribe So I, that could be true. I haven't found it. And the, the literature that I've looked at, even on choosing which drugs to prescribe and learning in the marketing literature. These guys are basically applied IO economists, so they, they have much more industry-specific knowledge than I do as a, as a simple macroeconomist. I haven't seen references to that. So it could be true. Exactly. So I, I might have to expand my search, and I, that's a good point. Yes? So feel free to delay the answer. But so in my experience, you can kind of manipulate the doctor in the sense that if they're good enough substitutes, yeah. please give me this other drug, right? Yeah. So let me, let me show you how I'm going to model the doctor. And it's just going to be an altruistic model where their patients play no role. Yeah, well, so that, that might be important for picking up some part of the diffusion as learning versus the yeah. So I'll say now, I was going to say it on the next slide, I'll say now um, the, the two types of things that, that could be going on that I think are most likely to be going on that I'm not going to capture in my structural model. One is advertising. So this is companies saying, use this drug. The other one is, is uh, doctors learning from patients or prescribing based upon what their patients tell them. Maybe their patients are talking to each other, hey, this new drug came out, and then they go to their doctor and ask for it. Those are two of the most predominant things that might be driving the statistical patterns that I'm going to show you that, that I, I'm not going to have in my structural model at this point. Um, Just, uh, the drugs you're going to look at, are they comfort drugs or are they like... Yeah, let me describe the context. Uh, they're going to be uh, uh, drugs that uh, are to help the health of the heart, which are hopefully to prevent heart attacks and extend length of life. Um, OK, I'm not going to spend too much time on literature now. Um, I've worked a bit on these idea diffusion uh, papers. Uh, relative to these papers, I think what we're going to add is sort of regions, geography, and we're going to add learning. So our doctors are going to be Bayesian learners. In this literature, usually it's sort of like a meet and copy productivity. If I meet you and you're better productivity than me, then my productivity becomes yours. Here it's going to be a very different micro me mechanism for how doctors are getting better over time. And so, like I said, I don't know the social learning literature as, as well as I should, but this is very much a paper about social learning on a network. So um, why am I writing this paper? And then let me tell you what I'm going to do. I mean, let me actually get into what I do. So I want to write down a structural model. I don't think that exists in this context. Um, one of the reasons you might want to do that is you can see how lowering barriers to knowledge diffusion might affect learning, accounting for the endogeneity of doctors exerting some effort in order to learn. Um, 
I think one thing that could be interesting is quantifying um, how, which, which are the, the biggest barriers to doctors. Uh, uh, so how much are the barriers uh, to, uh, to uh, drug misprescribing? What I mean by that is I have some limited data. I know the doctor's name. I know the, or basically I, I have an identifier for the doctor. I have the zip code that doctor lives in. I have the age of the doctor. And I have the med school that doctor went to. And I have the year that doctor graduated from med school. And so, um, so uh, that, that's going to this bullet point right here. I think what we're going to be able to do is have some quantification of sort of which variables uh, most affect knowledge diffusion in a sense that it could be, you know, geographic boundaries affect whether doctors seem to be learning from each other. It could be, you know, if you went to Minnesota, you do economics one day, way. You went to Harvard, you do economics another way. And sort of having a common way of, of, of learning really affects the type of research you do later in life. That might be true for, for a doctor. Too. I've, I've heard that, that claim made. Um, no, Chris, you were very careful to say quantify how much barriers to knowledge affect this drug mis mis prescribing. Yeah. That's very appropriate. You didn't say, because I suspect that what you're really going to quantify is how much do barriers to information diffusion. Yeah. Right. And what I want, what all of us to remember is suppose you weren't doing statins, suppose you were yeah. doing opioids. Yeah. We all wish now that the barriers to information diffusion had been much stronger 15 years ago. To that, no. Information diffusion. Oh, I mean. They all taught the wrong thing. Yeah, 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 yeah. When, that's right. Quickly, Look. and you got a whole bunch of people addicted to opioids. This is, this so is. Sometimes barriers to information diffusion. Can be positive if the knowledge is bad. Our value, that, that, that's yeah. something worth keeping in mind. That is a good point that I haven't thought of. Uh, yes, um, that's right. So let me just get into what I'm going to do. Uh, uh, statistical patterns, then a very stylized doctor problem. I might have to wave my hands in a couple places, but it, it, it'll show you sort of how I'm thinking about Bayesian learning. And then I'll, I'll put it in a dynamic context. This is going to be like super simple, um, just to give you a sense of where, where I'm going. So here's the data. There's a panel of um, over 100,000 doctors over this decade. Um, uh, we have, um, there's more zip codes. We actually have it at the five digit zip code level, um, which is just a lot, a lot of zip codes. So that's a relatively small geographic region in the US. And just because uh, it's just too much data to, to put on the computer for right now, we're just gonna aggregate up into just four digit zip codes. So these are, these are relatively small, uh, uh, Areas the doctors per zip code just to give you a sense of the, the size of the region on average something like 25 doctors The median amount of doctors in my region is going to be something like 10 doctors that prescribe this drug and there's a very common drug Yeah, so this is an unbalanced panel So if a doctor ever prescribed one time a statin uh, in this decade They're in my they're in my data set and I'm able to follow That's right, it's unbalanced panel. So unbalanced. It, if, they're, if they're ever in there, I know that they prescribed it once and then if they leave. And some of the, the results, maybe I should run on a balanced panel and I, I haven't gone into that. Yes, please. Uh, when you mention the geography, uh, you only uh, account on the, the postal code of each doctor, but uh, do you account the, whether they are in a big hospital or in a small community? Yeah, I do not know that information. Uh, what I do know is the number of prescriptions that a doctor prescribes per month. And so that will give me a sense of how big that doctor's practice is. But I don't know if that large practice is a large private practice or in a hospital. Um, OK. There, yes, absolutely. That, that's true, too. Um, so I have uh, six drugs in the market at the beginning of the sample, and uh, 12 are going to be added by the, the end of this decade. Um, and the generics, I think, are an interesting uh, uh, way of slicing this, this uh, into new, new molecules versus just uh, some drugs becoming generic. Just yeah. to give a sense, like which fraction of like, the total number of doctors ends up prescribing this drug so that they're in the sample? That's a good question. I should have an answer, and I don't. All I can say is this is an extremely common uh, drug. I think it's one of the most, by, 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 by prescriptions as a fraction of the population, one of the most popular drugs. Um, 
Okay, so here's, uh, there's a lot of ways you could slice the data. I want to get s some sense of the variability and prescription patterns across doctors. So here's the measure I'm going to use to do that. Um, I'm going to say the set of existing drugs, the, the time series uh, is a month, a uh, period is a month. Um, and there's going to be some number of drugs that, it, that exist to possibly pr be prescribed in any month. And then I'm just going to just let this say uh, there's some doctor and I'm going to index that doctor by I. Um, this is the important equation here. The oh no, this one. The share of drug D in doctor's portfolio of prescriptions is going to be this S. So doctor I prescribes, let's say, 20% uh, of, uh, of, uh, of his statin prescriptions are drug one, maybe 40% are drug two, and the rest are drug three or something like that. And that can change over time. This is in value terms share? No, this is literally in, in like number of prescriptions. Um, so this is a... Uh, 30 pills, so one pill. Yeah, yeah exactly. That, that's the idea. Um, and um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to try, in order to get a sense of the spread of this pattern across doctors, I'm going to write the standard deviation of drug J share across doctors at a given point in time. It's going to be this object here. So this is the, the, the standard deviation of uh, you know, how, how different are doctors in prescribing uh, lovastatin. Um, and then, just so I can give you some pictures, to get a sense of the, the convergence in scripting patterns over time, I'm going to plot, uh, or I'm going to consider the average standard deviation across the drugs over time. And so that's going to be a measure I'm going to show you in pictures, just so you can get a sense of what this, this pattern looks like, about how do dr the doctors' different patterns of scripting change over time and then change over region. Sure, yes. Should we think of the doctors as being subject to the same kind of patients with the same similar problems? Good question. So a lot of what I'm going to do, uh, I'm gonna, let me show you some pictures first, then I'm going to go to regressions, and the regressions are going to have some sort of fixed effects, maybe doctor or location, and I'll tell you what they're trying to capture, but roughly things like patient population uh, might, might be a very important thing. But for right now, I just want to give you some raw statistics, and then we'll, I'll give you regressions that allow us to speak a lot more about what these statistics might mean. Yeah, Omar? Um, they'll show up as, uh, as zeros or ones. Um, yeah, yeah, if, if they have no, if they only prescribe one, then they have... The zeros are particularly important in the sense that perhaps some of these drugs ah. become, become so obsolete. Yes. And why do you keep considering them? And, uh, they are completely out of the set of drugs. That's okay. Yeah, I, I don't think that, I think that could be something that could happen. And then we just see all doctors if it's, if it's announced by God that these drugs, this drug is obsolete and all doctors knew that, then that share would go to zero for all doctors and there'd be no heterogeneity across doctors there. But what's going to happen is that maybe some doctors learn that this drug was obsolete faster than others and so you'll see some dispersion for a while until maybe if, if the world is well described by the Bayesian learning model I'm going to write down, you see some convergence towards zero use of that drug over time. Yeah, I'll show you exactly what I'm going to do, but it, it's, it's to try to capture that. So, yeah. There is nothing that the FDA or the health department announced such that everyone, that you might then want to take out because that's an aggregate shock. So, yeah, yeah, so, so uh, let me show you, <laughs> this, this will get you a sense of aggregate shocks do occur. I don't think I want to take them out. I think I really want to say sometimes information is announced, maybe by the FDA, and all doctors should know that. They all have access to it at least. Um, and some doctors respond more than others. And maybe you know one doctor reads the news and then the other one talks to that this doctor. This may come as a giant surprise to you, but the FDA is often wrong. <laughs> but there, there. Because God, would, like FDA said, this is worthless. No, 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 no. But I yeah. was means, asking, means to me it is extremely valuable. <laughs> I was asking you if there is actually a law so you are not allowed anymore to prescribe this. Has there been any case like that? None for these. None in this class of drugs. In this class of drugs, once they have been introduced, they've always been allowed to be sold. 
Okay, so this is that measure that I was just telling you about. What I'm trying to show you is that scripting behavior converges across doctors over time. So here is that, stan that average standard deviation that, I, sh that I, I just described and how it's moving over time. These red lines are the uh, introduction of new drugs. Um, so when they're introduced to the market, um, and here's calendar time on the horizontal axis. And what you can see is that uh, over time, this sta average standard deviation is decreasing uh, seemingly uh, dramatically. And that means that doctors' prescription patterns, the share of each type of drug they're prescribing, uh, has, is getting closer and closer as time goes on. And now there's this big drop here, for example, when a new drug is introduced, not many doctors are using it at first. Um, uh, and so, but, but some are, there might be a lot of uh, heterogeneity at introduction. And so you might see it just a mechanically a big drop down. So what I want to show you to try to convince you, this really is something about uh, doctors uh, uh, scripting behavior converging over time, is this is for the original six drugs that were always around at the time period, at, at the start of my sample. The, the, the standard deviation across doctors is also decreasing um, for these drugs. So even the ones that aren't being being uh, invented. And so what I want to do is say this is some loose evidence without controlling for lots of other things, which the regressions will do, that there seems to be some convergence in the behavior of doctors and which drugs they're prescribing over time. So who would explain this, this jump? This yeah, this one I, I, I don't have a good sense. So this is where, like, as, as time goes on, I'll dig into the, the data a little bit and try to understand the, um, this, this is unusual and I, I don't know what happened there. Um, ah. Yeah, so I think what might ha happen here is that I have to do, short answer, I don't know, longer than maybe a, a generic was introduced here for one of the original six, um, and that could introduce a, a big change. Um, I don't know. So, yeah? So why, why is it so much, is it, why is it decreasing? So I would have expected to decrease for a while, jump up after a new drug is introduced and keep decreasing afterwards. So why is it? Yeah, so you, I can tell you a story, but, uh, but this... Okay, so saying, even in a world with diffusion, and there's no presumption that if I look at a time series, I should write out a statement... It didn't have to be like this. I could, yeah, so this is not a particular... This is not, you're not interpreting this as evidence of, uh, you know, diffusion or anything like that. No, I'm interpreting this as scripting behavior converges across doctors. <laughs> The, the, cross standard the, the standard deviation across drugs, uh, acro uh, of a drug across doctors, the fraction of a doctor's scripting vector that is in any given drug, that standard deviation on average is going down over time. That seems to me like if you can descri describe a doctor's scripting behavior um, by the vector of drugs as the, the states, uh, or sort of the, the drugs that exist, and then what fraction of drugs do they use uh, do they prescribe out of each of those? That's how I'm characterizing doctor scripting behavior, and the variance in that is going down over time. That's what I'm showing here. I also want to show you, uh, because generics exist, that um, uh, even if you're just looking at the um, uh, convergence in script share within a molecule, you can get the similar patterns. And so sort of fraction of the lovastatin, which is the generic, out of the total amount of this molecule that's, driven, that's prescribed, generic plus uh, branded one, that variance is going down over time. And that's going to be largely driven by uh, lots of people uh, switching to the generic. And so um, let's, keep it, let's keep it moving. So prescription uh, there's scripting behavior also converges across space. So take that same measure that I was showing you, that, that standard deviation, um, and now let's look at the prescriptive standard deviation across the US zip codes. And so it could have been sort of a, a within doctor across zip code effect, but I'm gonna show you there's also an across zip code effect that's going on. And so same pattern that you see here, sort of different locations are converging in the fractions of drugs that are being prescribed within those locations. And so that's some, some also some, this is the first sign of some spatial correlation. Um, okay, so now let me get to the, re the, the regressions, which we can address a little bit more some of the questions that came up. So I only have two of them to show you, and then I'm gonna switch to the, the structural model. So um, let me define the bilateral, uh, uh, this is the bilateral uh, Euclidean distance in prescription shares across doctors. So that's that, that, that measure we were talking about 
um, before, I'm going to regress this on a measure of spatial distance between zip codes. Um, and I'm also going to have um, a time trend um, in that. So that's going to be that same measure times month. Um, and then I'm going to have time fixed effects and doctor uh, uh, fix the fix the fix for the, um, the the two different doctors that we're doing because this is a bilateral measure and then there's going to be some error term and what I want to point out um, that's a good question I don't have yeah yeah so I don't have an answer to your question but I might have an answer to the concern I'm guessing you have by your question, by having a, uh, uh, a doctor pair fixed effect instead of the two separate uh, doctor fixed effects. Um, so let me see if that addresses your concern. Why not the nonlinear relationship? This validation is nonlinear, right? Yeah, uh, I, don't, I don't have a, a good answer for it right now. What I'm going to show you is a, a pattern. Uh, all I can say is uh, what I want to show you is that uh, because I estimate this tau hat to be positive, it seems like scripting patterns on average are less similar the more distant you, you have between doctors. So right now I'm trying to just show you this sign is positive. So it seems like. This is, goes the opposite sign relative to my prior. So this is the, uh, the loading on the time trend. Um, that interacted with distance, it seems like scripting patterns converge faster for more distant doctors. Um, and it's, rob yeah, and so one concern I had is maybe California and New York are actually closer than you would think by a measure of physical distance because of some sort of cultural difference. Um, I've tried to break this and this seems to be relatively robust. And so let me just throw that out there as I'm um, doing some, some regressions and, and interesting patterns seem to pop up. All I want to say at this point is there seems to be something spatial that, that's uh, systematic. What I'm concerned is not at all about. Okay. Is that imagine that there's an original thing, an original terminal of SI, yeah. which, it turns out, which depends, must depend on part of a shock to I. Uh -huh. Okay. And there is a variance. That epsilon i, then the difference will be very strongly correlated for, all, for example, for all the i's that have that zip code. You know, uh, okay, but when when I do the epsilon the of that there with uh, Bella Terra, if I see yeah. epsilon of uh, Bella Terra Barcelona is very high, I must be the case that the epsilon of the is also very high. So uh, I think I understand, but I'm not great in real time at, at this stuff. So let me let me see why I thought this might. I, I probably could correct why I thought this might control for that is when I'm holding a fixed effect for Bella Terra and Barcelona, then whatever their time zero shocks were, I'm going to hold that fixed, and then I'm only going to be looking for variation. Um, within the Bellaterra Barcelona pair. And so that would account for the whatever is uh, uh, common within that pair over time, which might be the time zero shock. So I, I could be it's missing it. Okay, okay, this is useful to, to I, I make a mental note that I need to think about that, but in real time, I don't know if I can get it. So I've got, yeah, Citrus? I thought it would be interesting, like, rather than these time fixed effects, you'd be interested, like, in some time trend, right? Because you were showing us these pictures, you know, that these things were converging. Yeah, yeah, so, so this, is, this is over time. The, these things are converging uh, um, slower uh, if you're close together. That's what this says. So this is about over time convergence interacted with distance. That's, that's what this says. And I have, a, I have another one here. So what this says is there's a systematic spatial component to convergence. That's, you, that's all uh, I'm making the claim, that, the title. Here I want to tell you that there's, um, um, there seems to be some spatial component uh, that, that uh, uh, predicts whether a doctor in a given location is going to start prescribing a drug. And this is the last uh, data uh, analysis I'll give you that's statistical. Then I want to get to the model because I have about 10 minutes left. And so does the scripting by Dr. I of drug J um, at time T depend on what, what his neighbors are doing. Um, and the way I'm going to try to get at that is I'm going to write an indicator function um, to be one uh, uh, 
if, uh, if there's a positive amount of scripts for drug J in location Z at time T. So if a doctor has, is prescribing some amount, any positive amount in this location, then that's positive. And this D, Z, Z prime is going to be the log distance from zip code Z to the nearest Z prime zip code that does have a doctor prescribing. So what I'm looking is, are you more likely to prescribe um, uh, to have a positive amount of prescriptions for a particular drug if yesterday you had a positive amount of prescriptions for a particular drug and um, if someone close to you is prescribing this. Uh, and that's what this is trying to get at. And there's a lot of persistence, which I don't think is very surprising. But I think the tendency to prescribe a drug is increasing in the proximity to the nearest pr prescriber in the previous month. And this is another way of just trying to say there seems to be some systematic spatial relationships between whether doctors are prescribing drugs or not and what's happening in their geography around them. Yeah, yeah. So, so exactly. So I do not know that. Um, it is. Uh, it could be some spatial pattern of uh, advertising, or it could be something about there are there are, are patients in certain regions that are more likely to benefit from uh, one drug than the other. So imagine the you know, pardon the you know crassness. Uh, uh, let's say more men and more women in different regions, and men uh, uh, do better with drug one, women do better in drug two. What I'm doing here is the zip month and drug month fixed effects are crucial because what the assumption is going to be is that if the population uh, is not changing within a location over time, then, then any of that variation is not going to be driving the estimate that I have. So the, the concern would be... Yes. Yeah. 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 So the two types, the two types of information stories I can't rule out are are drug companies spatially advertising and patients uh, spatially learning and talking to each other. So that that is at this point what I haven't been able to rule out. I'm trying to get data on advertising, um, and I think I might be able to get it. I don't know the patients. I think I'm probably doomed on. So, so in, I don't have much time left, so I want to show you the structural model that I'm trying to build. And I'm not going to uh, be able to run these regressions on this simple structural model that I have, but the goal is have the simple one to show you the, the, the types of interactions I'm trying to model, and then have the more complicated one that might include some advertising or other things. Then I'd have a hope of running the same regression I do in the data on the data generated by my model. And so uh, I only have you know, a few, five minutes left or something like that, so what I want to do is is just give you a sense of how am I thinking about modeling this and see if you guys uh, you know, have some advice on you know, how I can improve it. So let there be a unit measure of doctors at each location who treat a unit measure of patients. And let me be very upfront, I am doing a ton of reverse engineering to do whatever assumptions I need to get analytically tractable uh, final uh, problem for the doctor that I can solve. And because I want this to be the simple model that conveys intuition. And so the patient uh, is indexed by nu in 0, 1, and it receives benefits, utility, from drug D, depending on who that patient is. And I'm going to model that as some beta 0 D, so that's a drug-specific uh, uh, benefit um, that's independent of patient, times some patient-specific value of a given drug. Um, and beta 0 D is the unconditional efficacy of drug D, sort of integrating across all patients a to D, yeah, is this, I don't know, error term, idiosyncratic term um, that is observed by the doctor. So I'm going to say uh, the doctor knows um, that your type uh, knew. The altruistic doctor says, um, if I knew this true efficacy of the drug, I would prescribe the drug that maximized the utility to the patient. But the problem is going to be new drugs are going to come on the market, or as some drugs are on the market, I don't know the unconditional efficacy of drug one versus drug two, and I'm going to have to learn about it. And the way I'm going to just model that is there's going to be some, some error, this mu, between the true drug and the doctor's beliefs. And so doctor, in location, doctor I in location N is going to have these beliefs about the unconditional efficacy of drug D. And I'm going to uh, say the beliefs uh, have a particular distribution, it's a, a random variable, and the doctor knows the distribution of its potential mistakes, but the doctor does not know his actual uh, mistaken belief and how far it is away from the truth. So they know that they're likely to be wrong, they don't know how, how wrong they are. 
Then I'm going to uh, write down a model in which the doctor has preferences that are increasing in the benefit to patients and decreasing in uncertainty. So the doctor would rather uh, give the right drug to the right patient and would rather know more instead of less about the unconditional efficacy of drugs. And I'm going to pick a particular functional form that just plays nice with some equations uh, to get back that out. Um, and um, that's going to be this big U function here. So let me show you what I'm going to, how I'm going to um, write down the utility a doctor has if he's Dr. I in location N uh, of issuing drug D at time T to patient nu. For each patient nu, the doctor chooses D to maximize his expected utility um, across all possible mistaken beliefs. And so here, he knows that um, he has some mistaken beliefs and he's going to integrate with respect to his mistaken belief distribution. And so here's the, the doctor that was just the utility uh, function that I specified, G, um, but it's a function of the value of giving the right drug to the right patient um, and uncertainty about nu, about, about beta, and this is the distribution about this mu. But does he care about uncertainty itself per se? Or because this affects then the of the patient. So I will show you the G function on the next, on the next slide, and that'll, that'll tell you everything he cares about. Um, so before I get there, the total payoff for a doctor I in location N in period T is this then the integral over all the patients that the doctor is going to prescribe. And so now I'm taking an integral um, of the expected utility per patient over all the patients. And I made this nice convenient assumption that the doctor sees a measure, uh, measure one of patients so I can use law of large numbers on this F distribution. So now I'm completely reverse engineering functional forms that are going to be very convenient for my dynamic system. So the doctor, I'm going to say, is risk averse, where this G function is the following. Um, uh, U tilde is the, the, the this, this uh, beta, is the value um, that, uh, that the patient gets. Um, one minute. Um, U tilde is the value the patient gets. This, uh, this measure here is a measure of the uncertainty. Um, and I'm going to assume whatever I need to get convenient functional forms. I'm going to assume this mu is, is normal, and of course it has to be consistent with the learning model I put in. And I'm going to assume some common beliefs uh, uh, for a doctor. The variance is at least common across all drugs. This is something I'd love to relax. We will in the future. And so then utility is just the expected utility um, uh, over all of the patients, um, and you just get this nice convenient functional form. And so I only have one minute left, so let me, let me just, uh, you have to take my word for it. I'm writing down Bayesian learning. And so the Bayesian learning method uh, model just says you have some prior, you're going to get some signals, and you're going to get a posterior. And the, the summing over J is the, is the important part here. J is a location. So I'm going to get signals from all sorts of different locations, and then I'm going to get uh, sort of my, my posterior will be my prior, times sort of uh, updated by the signals I get across all locations. I did something very clever and probably appropriate in this application, which is to make the prescription decision in some sense static, mm -hmm. patient-centered. There's no role for experimentation. Exactly. And that was because we wanted to have a chance of solving the dynamic system with a network. Um, and so we needed to make the, the prescription decision as simple as possible to give the hope to making the dynamic decision a little bit more complicated, allowing for the network structure. So what, you, what information you see does not in any way depend on your prescription decision. Exactly. You, you, uh, by assumption. By assumption. Right. And so this is the last, uh, uh, give me one more minute and I'll, I'll wrap up. Um, where is the in the signaling? Perfect. Uh, right here. This is, this is the last consequential slide. Um, okay, so w all of that was to lead up to, um, this is the little hand waving, um, the dynamic problem for a doctor. Um, this, what I was trying to build was a micro foundation for the um, utility function of the doctor um, where the state variable is basically the effective number of signals you've received over time, which is basically your current state of knowledge. And what you're going to be choosing is how much you want to invest in getting more signals. And so um, this was all to get all that micro foundation and, and Frechet and, and normal uh, and functional forms was to get this being CRRA 
uh, minus some linear cost. They can tr choose to pay a cost to invest in signals. What does that buy you? Um, that gives you a law of motion for your knowledge, which is an effective amount of signals, is all the signals you had yesterday plus some intensity, which is the thing you're paying for, of getting new signals, um, and the signals are going to be drawn, uh, you get a signal from every location J, and the, what determines uh, distance um, is this tau function. And tau acts just like in a, in a Eaton Cordum trade model as a barrier that says sort of if doctors in location J are really knowledgeable, but you have a small tau with them, then you don't get a lot of information from them, even if you invest a lot. And so this is too fast at this point for, you, for me to expect you to take it all in. But you have to take my word that the, the taus here are going to be um, um, uh, the sort of structure of geography. And what all of this is going to boil down to, a super simple first order condition, stacking a bunch of variables. This is the law of motion for knowledge for each doctor in each location. And then uh, the way I've cooked it up, I get a homogeneous constant coefficient linear difference system of equations. So if you tell me time zero knowledge, I can very trivially tell you what knowledge is going to be for any doctor in any location as time, for any period of time. And so I'm going to wrap up here, but uh, I have some simple numerical examples um, that show you sort of as you change the tau uh, matrix, which is sort of changing geography, who's close to learning from what, you can get different uh, patterns of learning. And so here, more connected doctors learn faster, and uh, knowledge, as knowledge increases, you can get scripting patterns converging, trying to get uh, closer to those original uh, plots that I showed you. And if you switch sort of uh, who's connected to who, Doctor 2 now learns more from Doctor 3 because I reduced their, their measured distance. Then Doctor 2 uh, you know, knows more than Doctor 3 in equilibrium. And uh, you know, Doctor 1 could benefit from that because he's connected to Doctor uh, uh, 3 through Doctor 2. And so that's, uh, sorry I ran a little bit over time. Um, lots to do, but you can see some statistical patterns of, of uh, learning uh, or of, of prescripting patterns, and I think uh, we're the first to have this structural model of spatial social learning, and that's what we're trying to do. So, I'm done, sorry. <laughs>